So I've often been asked, what is the most favorite expedition that I've ever been on? And it's so difficult to say, but there is nothing more exciting than going on an extremely long solo expedition. And rowing across the Atlantic Ocean for me, five and a half thousand kilometers for 76 days alone, was one of the most epic experiences of my life. See, this story that I tell, although it's just me rowing across an ocean, it's a story of a whole lot of people. It's a story of pain, it's a story of suffering, it's a story of laughter. You'll see me making friends with birds and fish, close encounters with marlin and whales and ships, massive storms, blistered hands, boils on your buttocks, you may not see too much of that. But it's an incredible story because it encompasses almost everything that we do in life. It's a story of love, it's a story of passion, of tenacity, of perseverance. This is Not Alone. The ocean remains one of man's final frontiers. It is a place of great contrast and mystery and can range from hurricane strength storms to total and utter silence. It can be a place of great joy and a place of, of sheer cruelty. I totally love being on the ocean. The ocean is a place that, that makes me feel most alive and it has a hold on me like nothing else in life does. My name is Peter van Kitz and the ocean is my life. So there I was again in the middle of the ocean, like in my dream, tired, sore, blisters on my hands and boils in my bottom, miles from my loved ones, from my home and from my family. The obvious question that would come to mind is, so who in their right mind would want to row five and a half thousand kilometers unsupported across the Atlantic Ocean as a solo? My story actually starts at the end of my last journey. In 2007, I took part in the Atlantic rowing race with a very good friend and rowing partner, Bill Godfrey. We rowed from the Canary Islands to Antigua in one and a half hour shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 50 days, winning the pairs division of the Woodvale Atlantic rowing race. Unbelievable, here we are in Antigua. 5,000 kilometers away from the start. We've done it. We've pushed hard. And it's just, oh, it's just unbelievable. We are going to celebrate tonight. Getting to the quay inside English Harbor and seeing hundreds of people singing in Kosi Sikalele and just absolutely celebrating a South African win is the highlight of my life. All I wanted to do was hold my family and tell them <laughs> and tell them that I'd never ever do that again to them. It was on this small island that I had made a promise two years previously to my wife Kim that I would never ever again row in the Atlantic rowing race. A promise that I was not to keep. Well everyone knows that the first thing Pete had to say on arrival in Antigua last time was Never again, Kim, never let me do this again. But desire is a very powerful thing. Uh, once a tiny seed of it has entered my mind, then it, it's something that needs to be done. In life, you've got to be really be careful about what you dream about. It may just come true. I had a lot of work to do before the start of the race. 
I had a lot of preparation and planning to do, so I had to get stuck in as quick as possible. Oh, no, I, I think he's cooked, eh? <laughs> he's, he survived the first one admirably, and now he's wanting to do it alone. I think he's absolutely nuts. He's mad, 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 mad. <laughs> Stupid to be trying to do it again. <laughs> he's a man with a mission and he's got a vision. And I tell you what, uh, I respect that. He's absolutely convinced. And uh, yeah, it's part of his bigger plan. And the guy's going about it in exactly the right way. Pete came to me straight after he spoke to Kim and, and told me he wanted to row solo. Even though out at sea he, he told me that he wanted to do something solo one day but not row across an ocean. Uh, he came to me and said, well, remember that conversation. So how does one train for an event like this? An event that spans over five and a half thousand kilometers and can take anything between 50 and 120 days to complete. I sought out the best advice that I could get and that was from the guru of sports science, Professor Tim Noakes from the Sports Science Institute of South Africa in Newlands in Cape Town. Sometimes it's difficult to stay focused on other things that you need to be planning and preparing when the sponsorship issues are, are, are so big and you're getting so many negative responses from, from all the uh, corporates that you're sending letters to. I had 10 months to go before the start of the race. I still didn't have a boat. I needed to build a boat. And then all of a sudden, Liberty came along. Hello, Marvin. Nice to meet you. And do you know what happens from here? Once more and more people get here, it just... And I think Pete's been a massive galvanizational people actually now seeing the real manifestation of what only your life can be and what it means and that's the beauty of people. Liberty was awesome. They were a fantastic sponsorship to have. I did two things as soon as I exited the main building. One was to phone Kim to tell her that I had got the sponsorship and when I spoke to her she screamed with joy and the second one was to the boat builder Uwe to tell him that I got the sponsorship and that he must get his factory ready for my boat molds. It was a very exciting time. I couldn't believe that things were starting to get together. The plan was coming into effect and uh, things were starting to look good. It was nice for me to know that I could just leave him with the molds and that he had the ability to just carry on with building them so that I could focus on the engine, which is my body. I had a lot of work to do. I was still recovering from the Atlantic Rowing Race in 2008. And uh, so I had a lot of work to do to, to get ready physically for the race. One of the big issues uh, for me is weight. So obviously I want to try and put on as much weight as possible and while I'm training, not to lose too much weight. Pete's been an absolutely awesome athlete to train. He's uh, well disciplined and motivated and it's been a real privilege being part of his preparation team. Usually about half an hour on the bike, half an hour on the rowing machine and then about two hours of gym. I think physically he is much better prepared. I think he's fitter now than what he was at the start of the race uh, two years ago. Obviously the big unknown factor is the whole newness of being alone. And I think the one thing he is not prepared for obviously is what it's going to feel like to be on his own for that long. Uh, I remember when my brother used to come back from, uh, from the army. I used to hang on to his back and used to dive into the pool. He'd make me hold my breath to the other side. Peter's doing the race again, number one, because it's there. It's a challenge. He, li he loves challenges whole life. He does challenges all the time and he always succeeds. He is going to do it again and he is going to win the singles race. I decided to build my boat out of composite materials because they were both light and extremely strong. I wanted to be on a boat that would be able to go fast and to be able to withstand the massive storms um, that I could face in the Atlantic Ocean. I named my boat Nyamazela, which is a closer word meaning to push through hard times. How apt that word would become in my race and how appropriate it would be, only time would tell. I had lots of fun shopping for my food and other supplies that I needed for the journey. Important things like biltong, what good South African could ever go on an expedition without biltong. Olive oil to add the extra calories to the meals that I was going to have. Wet wipes for my poor bottom, you know, all sorts of things, creams that I needed for my skin, multivitamins. You know, the water that I drink out at sea is, is dead water, so I need to replace the vitamins and minerals um, with something. I had a lot of fun shopping. Every single time I come off ship, 
that's what I use. <laughs> I imagine it takes up a lot less space than toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, it does. And toilet paper gets wet. This is wet already. One of the things that I was about to learn that I should have learned long before was that nothing really ever runs on time. The main structure of my boat was eventually complete. There were still thousands and literally thousands of little things that needed to be fitted onto the boat. Time was really running out and I had a lot of work to do on it. Over Jaspersen, Steve Detoy and Robert Galley spent a lot of time making sure that everything that was installed on my boat or built on my boat, all the electronics was done 100% perfectly. As it goes with most expeditions, a few weeks before the final leaving date, things turn into a frenzy of activity. I had boat launches to go to, I had motivational presentations to give, I had clients to see, and at the same time I was trying to maintain the relationship with my family, with my wife and my daughter Hannah. I wanted to spend some quality time before I left with them. So it really became uh, quite a, a frenzied time of activity. Daniel Bedingfield on I'll Go FM and Pete uh, Fregheads, how's it going? Uh, really? yeah, going Have you been on dry it. land a little bit lately? Uh, two years ago, yourself and Bill Godfrey decided that you were going to row from the Canary Islands all the way to Antigua. Yeah. Now you're back here to yes. tell us that you're doing it again. I am. <laughs> but you're doing it alone. Yes, yes. Then finally, the big day came. The day that I was going to put Nyamazela in the water for the first time. But then when I eventually did put it in the water, she sat beautifully. And she was a really beautiful boat and is a beautiful boat. It was a great feeling to be out there on Yamazela for the first time. Packing my boat into the container was a big occasion for me. There were many, many things that I had to make sure that were done properly. One of the most important things that I focused on was the packing of my biltong. I'm a South African, I had to take biltong with me. We vacuum packed our food into double-sided silver packing bags and then we put labels on that said dehydrated food. So we weren't lying, but it was a good way to get the biltong into the European Union. I get very scared with forklifts around my boat. <laughs> I can just imagine. <laughs> And then Schenker were brilliant, you know, uh, strapping the boat into, a, into the container because the container gets bashed around at sea and the last thing I wanted to do was get to the Canary Islands and find that my boat had a hole in it or something. So I had to be present uh, to make sure that the boat was strapped in properly. I feel very strongly connected to Africa. I'm a child of Africa. I'm the only African to be taking part in the Woodvale Atlantic Growing Race 2009. And if I'm successful at this, I'll be the first African ever to row solo across any ocean. One of the villages here, one of the local villages that I trained through, and um, they're giving me a little bit of a farewell. And uh, now we're going to sit down and have some beer. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> A lot of people say to me, geez, Pete, it's going to be really hard out at sea. You know, what about the big storms and the lightning and the, and the sores on your hands and your, and your bottom, you know, and being alone for such a long period of time. You know, for me, all of those things seem to be irrelevant. For me, the toughest thing is going to be missing my wife and especially my little daughter, Hannah. Something that I will never forget in my whole life was reversing out of our driveway, going to the airport to say goodbye to Kim and Hannah on my way to the Canary Islands. As we reversed out, I thought two things. First of all, I looked at our house and our garden and I wondered to myself if I'd ever see that place again. And the second thing, I turned around to Kim and I said, Kim, the next time I drive into this driveway, I'm going to have a story to tell.
And I wonder what that story is going to be about. Leaving Kim and Hannah was a very painful experience. But what really helped was being able to focus totally on the race that was lying ahead of me. The race was going to start at the quaint port town of San Sebastian on the island of La Gomera, part of the Canary Islands, just off the coast of Africa. These beautiful islands are the last port that Christopher Columbus used on his quest to sail across to the Americas. Being back in La Gomera was quite a weird feeling for me. You know, the last time I left there, I, I thought that I'd never ever see those islands again. Um, now being back here with all the familiar things, all the same people owning the shops and owning the pubs and owning the restaurants it was quite a weird feeling for me. It was, a, it was like I was in a world of suspended reality. I was really enjoying my time being back. Having won the previous race made me feel even more special being amongst the rowing competitors. And I just I absolutely loved being back there. Sun is shining. Doris Daisy is here. Loads of boats arrive now. There's about 25 of them in this little sort of shelter. And more come off the container. Big container that's here. Before the race in 2007, I remember chatting to a good friend of mine, Cliffy Coombs. When I came to think about who I should have help me and manage me for this race that I was doing now as a solo, Cliffy was the first person to come to mind. I mean, he was the natural choice for me. Initially, when the, when the, when the whole uh race issue came up. I, I remember when him and Bill rode, uh, Pete got to the end of the race and I heard kind of three days into the ra his race with Bill that the two of them were rowing and I, I, I got the, the, an email from a mate of Pete's up, Guy Fowl up in East London saying check this out and I went onto the internet and I was, I was hooked. I was, I was blob watching then from, from then until the end of, of, of him and Bill's race and at the end of the race Pete came back and said Pete how come you didn't tell me you were doing this thing? You know? Could have really helped you out with some media stuff in Cape Town and immediately we hooked him up with a couple of interviews Got things going, and, and I think it kind of set a bit of a sort of put a sort of thing in Pete's mind. I think that that yeah, I think if he wanted something done, I'd, I'd be able to help him. The very first morning, waking up in our little apartment in San Sebastian, I couldn't believe what was happening. Cliffy walked in with a cup of tea, and I knew immediately from that moment on that I had definitely made the right choice of of uh, team captain. He was the man. The experience that I had with the other rowers that were taking part in the race was phenomenal. What an amazing group of talented people. It was really great going from row to row, just chatting about the, our different preparations and our different routes that we were planning. Nobody was hiding anything from each other. It was, it was like we were not competitors, that we were fellow expeditioners, fellow adventurers. It's a pity that I live I'm the only person from Africa and I live so far away from them. I would love to be able to stay in contact and stay friends with them after the race. They just a, a really are a great bunch of people. My biggest worry though was actually with the best friend I had made on the island and that was Charlie Pitcher. The moment I saw his boat and the moment he unraveled his secret weapon I knew that my chances of winning the race were not good. He had built a boat within the race rules and he had trained properly, he had been meticulous about his preparation um, on that boat. The boat that he was using would definitely be able to make use of every tiny bit of scrap wind that would come from behind. Welcome to my home for 70 days. This is the main cabin, it's forward, it's the forward part of the boat, which is um, totally the opposite to the other boats like Peter Van Kett's boat. What we've got here is a 5.7 metre boat and that's, this is the front and um, the centre plate that is all integral to the design, you can see it's up at the moment and I can actually drop it down. When I don't need it, I can just pull it back up again. <laughs> 